God blesses whoever hears this um, so that your soul might be saved. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Sean Weed. I, uh, I was born in, in, well, not born, but raised in uh, Bernice, Louisiana, small town, population 2,500. Um, technically right outside of it in a small uh, community uh, by the name of Pisgah. Um, when I was uh, 19 years old, I joined the Marine Corps and I actually uh, have this to show you. <laughs> this is my military ID. That's me as a staff sergeant in the Marines. I know that I've gained a lot of weight. Um, uh, this is my Marine Corps active duty uh, card that I should have turned in my left, but um, after 13 years they owe me something. I only had another seven to go to retire, but um, just wasn't happy, so I got out. And, uh, and uh, now I'm living in California. I am happy now. I'm uh, married, have a um, beautiful little baby girl. Um, she just turned two years old. And, uh, but the thing that I want to uh, tell you about is uh, something that happened to me um, while I was still in the Marine Corps. And uh, this is my testimony of hell. Um, I believe, if my memory doesn't fail me, it was uh, April the 4th of 1994, which is kind of a hard date to forget, 444. Um, I was in um, 29 Palms, California, but we Marines called it 29 Stumps. And uh, in the middle of this desert, there was a little uh, tiny camp called Camp Wilson. Um, um, I was uh, in the middle of a training cycle because uh, I was with artillery. And every time we go from uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, to 29 Palms, California, to do training, we stay there for two months. Um, in the very middle of it, we have a, a four-day uh, period of um, leave. We call it a 96, which is uh, 24 uh, times four. Anyway, if you do the math in your head real quickly, you'll see that it's 96 hours. Um, I had, uh, I was at that time, uh, not, not a, uh, a, a, what I would consider a Christian. Um, I'd grown up in a Baptist church. I knew about heaven and hell and, um, well, as much as anyone can know uh, when you're only 22 years old. Um, but, uh, I wouldn't really consider myself a staunch Christian. Um, at that time, I was pretty much doing my own thing, living my own life, my own way. Um, was not married, um, but still sleeping around, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, just basically uh, living the life of a of a hellion, <laughs> and. Uh, During this four-day period that uh, we're waiting for one set of uh, ground pounders or grunts, as we call them, to go home and the other ones to come to California for training, because they only train for three weeks um, when they go to California. So they, one company leaves, the other one comes back, and it's a four-day transition. During that four-day transition, uh, we as artillery is gi are given uh, an alternative um, between three choices. One, stay at the camp because you're completely broke. Um, two, uh, go to Disneyland or Disney World, whatever, whichever it is in California. And uh, three, to go to a Vegas package, obviously, which is drinking, gambling, so on and so forth. Um, I myself had uh, drank like a fish pretty much every night, so um, I was broke along with uh, two other devil dogs as we like to call ourselves um, one by the name of Jason Laycock at that time he was a uh, corporal uh, 
and S2 Intelligence, and the other one was Toby Page, who was also a corporal in uh, S1 Administration. I myself was uh, S3, which is Fire Directional Control. And uh, at that time, um, I was a Lance Corporal, so I was one rank beneath them. Um, so, Lance Corporal Sean Weed, or Lance Corporal Weed, because we only pretty much went by last names anyway. Um, I know, strange name. Anyway, um, we were sitting around in 110 degrees sweltering weather because it was just really uh, nothing else to do at camp other than sit around and talk. So we were all three sitting around. Um, uh, Corporal Laycock bro broke out his pictures and we were all uh, sitting around looking at him and he took some extraordinary pictures because uh, he had the opportunity um, to go right up to the edge of the, uh, the impact area. Uh, <laughs> and even we both had an argument about him going into the uh, buffer zone, but they have like an 800 meter buffer zone around the impact area. Uh, and he drove right up through that. You know, no one's supposed to pass that buffer zone, but uh, he drove right into it and got right up on the edge of the impact area and took some amazing photos. Um, uh, he was one of those guys that was intelligent but at the same time was always willing to push the barriers um, of stupidity, <laughs> uh, which he did. But needless to say, uh, the photos that he took were uh, absolutely stunning. Um, he, after we got through uh, viewing his photos, uh, he broke out his camera and realized he only had uh, three photos left to take before there was the end of the film. So he had us get up. He took a picture of his uh, green folding cot, which had everything he owned underneath it. Um, uh, Alice pack, sea bag, boots, you name it, it was all underneath there. Um, and then uh, we took a buddy picture where we were like leaning on each other, like, you know, best of friends. And then uh, for his last picture, he, uh, he looks at it and goes, oh, I only have one left. And then he looks over and he sees this uh, noose dangling from the ceiling. Um, the noose was made of hay rope, uh, which had tiny little sprigs sticking out from it. Um, and the noose was hanging from a rafter that was uh, inside the A-frame, was only about six foot eight inches from the ground. And uh, the, the noose actually hung all the way down uh, till it was about a foot and a half off the ground. So it wasn't like... Anybody was worried about hanging themselves. You'd have to lay down on the ground to hang yourself with this thing, literally. Um, and of course, it was made of hay rope, so it wasn't like wax rope, which slides really easily to close the noose. So I mean, you could literally step your foot in the in the noose without having to lift your knee above a 90 degree angle and uh, stand up on it, grab the rope, and literally stand up inside the noose, and it wouldn't tighten down around your foot. Um, at least not before your foot touched the ground, anyway. Um, so you can put your full body weight on it. So, I mean, the Marines, when they get bored, they do all kinds of stupid things with rope. Um, you know, like, this one guy made a, uh, a, a muscle for a horse. Another guy took it and made daisy chains out of it. And uh, another guy just took it and made a 13 knot noose. He was absolutely bored, had nothing to do. Um, nobody really cared. We always just went around it. It wasn't like it was a big deal or anything. Um, but anyway, for the last picture, he looks over the news and he goes, I got an idea. And usually when an intelligence guy says that, uh, it usually ends up being the equivalent of, uh, you know, a redneck saying, hey, y'all watch this, <laughs> you know. So uh, it, it usually turns out bad for everyone, which it did. Um, anyway, he, uh, uh, since I was the lowest man on the totem pole, he says, hey, Weed, why don't you... Uh, of course, on top of that, I was a little bit crazy. Um, he said, hey, Reed, why don't you uh, go over there and stick your head inside that noose and act like you're dead, and I'll take the last picture. I'm like, okay. Uh, I'm thinking to myself, not a bad idea. And uh, we, I went over there, stuck my head in the noose. And, of course, I had to kneel down. Uh, so I squatted down, you know, towards the ground so I'd have uh, a little bit of tension on the rope so it looked like I was actually hanging, and he was just going to take a picture from my waist up. Anyway... Um, uh, 
he went to take the picture and the battery had died, so um, the camera obviously just shut down. So he went back over there and was replacing the batteries while he was doing that. A couple pages walked up and began whispering in his ear, and I was, that should have automatically given it away. And it kind of did. I was kind of suspicious from that point, um, but uh, it was um, those suspicions were kind of like thrown out when Corporal Laycock looks at him, you know, and goes, "No, um, that's not the way it works. If I buy, you fly," and he took out his wallet, took out a $10 bill, and uh, gave it to a couple page, and a couple page went running out the back door. And in the meantime, I, uh, you know, he had to replace the camera, replace, replace the batteries in the camera, and we went back over there, and, you know, he was uh, giving me direction. He's like, all right, now let your arms dangle loose. Now close your eyes, you know, relax them. Don't, don't make any wrinkles, you know. Uh, you know, stick your tongue out a little, you know. Um, cock your head to the side a little bit, you know, and he's giving me all these uh, instructions so to make a, uh, uh, an, a real looking photo, and uh, I didn't know it, but at that time, um, he was using his voice to uh, mask the footsteps that were sneaking up behind me. Corporal Page had gone out the front door and came in the back door right behind me and was sneaking up on me. He grabbed the knot and slammed it down around my throat, uh, just as I, uh, just as I had uh, had exhaled um, so uh, immediately I stood up stunned you know because I didn't know number one I didn't know that he was sneaking up behind me number two I just got this rope slammed down around my neck and number three I couldn't breathe so I immediately stood up and um, and uh, I knew I had, had just seconds left maybe six to eight seconds because I had just exhaled and I couldn't breathe back in um, so I jammed a finger into the, to the knot and actually scratched my neck in the process of doing it. Um, I grabbed the, well I had a finger in the noose and I grabbed the knot in the back and I was pulling against it, but uh, what I didn't understand is that uh, the rope comes down through the knot, comes off to the side around your neck, and then comes back up through. Um, so if you don't grab this knot and twist it over to the side, you'll never get this rope to slide because it's at an L. It's like this. It's, it's hooked into there, and it won't come loose until you straighten it out. Um, of course, it was on the back of my neck, and I didn't have all that much time to think about it. So I'm just grabbing the knot and pulling for all that I'm worth. And uh, with one finger, it was just not enough strength. So I shoved another finger in there. And... Uh, and grabbed the knot and I knew only had seconds left and I had I said to myself I have one shot one chance to get this right um, otherwise I'm a dead man <coughs> so uh, I showed the second finger in there and I grabbed the knot and I closed my eyes and I clenched my teeth and I pulled for everything that I was worth and uh, I felt something give way and I fell forward and I was out, and I was glad to be out. Um, and the guys, they just looked at me, and they go, ah, like this. And I'm, I gave them a few choice words, you know, <laughs> which I will not repeat. Um, anyway, they just turned around and went over and uh, sat down on their uh, cots, and I went over and sat down with them. I sat down right beside uh, Corporal Jason Laycock. And Corporal Tubby Page was sitting right across from him. Um, Corporal Page reached underneath his uh, cot and pulled out a, uh, a brown paper bag. He unrolled it, and inside of it was a white aphes bag uh, filled with uh, what we call gee dunk or uh, snacks, candy, soda, stuff like that, chocolate, you know, chocolate chip cookies, whatever. Um, and I actually leaned forward and looked down inside the bag and I saw that he had mostly was some Ho-Hos and some Twinkies and uh, Star Crunches. He had a couple Gatorades inside of there, lemon, lime, orange. And uh, you know, I was, at that point I was like, okay, you... <laughs> You didn't need anything to eat. You already had a bag full, you know. 
but in the meantime, um, he began, you know, he closed up his bag and was eating some Ho-Hos, which comes three in a package. And uh, these are the ones with the chocolate icing around the outside, but on the inside it looks like a swirl of uh, chocolate cake and icing. Uh, pretty good. You can actually, like, twirl them and eat them at the same time until there's nothing left with the center. Um, but anyway, um, he was munching on that and telling this story about how the last time he came back from CAX, which is combined arm exercise, that's when artillery, the infantry, and uh, air all assault the target at the same time. Of course, it's well coordinated to make sure that we don't hit each other. Um, that would be a bad thing and it result in many lost lives, which is not a good thing during training. Of course, if you don't train that way, you don't win in battle. Um, you know, when the stakes are really there and the stakes are really high, so you gotta train as if it was the real thing, and that's what we do. We train hard and long, and uh, sometimes we train dangerously, but um, overall it helps us uh, come home alive. Uh, but anyway, um, oh, I just blanked out. Oh, um, anyway, he was telling this story about. Uh, how he had come back from combined arms exercise and uh, how he was wearing his tuxedo, how he went to Club 108 and slid across the dance floor, uh, knelt down and gave his girlfriend a dozen roses. It was while wearing these um, bear shoes that had the little white claws on them. You know, kind of like you wear when you're about to, you know, lounge around your house in your pajamas. Uh, well, anyway, it was a strange story, I know, but, uh, Probably not as strange as one I'm telling. But anyway, um, he took about five minutes to tell this story, and uh, I'd heard it once already, so I was just sitting there listening, sitting next to Corporal Jason Laycock. And uh, Jason Laycock was just pestering, just bugging him to death for one of those ho hos. You know, every like 15 seconds he'd be like, uh huh, yeah, can I get one? Oh, yeah, that's neat. Uh, how about now? You know, and he's just, I mean, pestering him, and I'm just looking at the two. And uh, three times while he told this, while he was telling this story, he leaned over and he would look me right in the face uh, as he was wrapping up the third one and uh, wrapping up his story. And finally he gave over half of a ho-ho um, to Jason Laycock. He leans over and he looks at me right in the face, and he's only a, four feet away from me. He leans over and he looks me right in the face. He goes, I don't think he's playing. Of course... We're the only three in the room, so I'm just like, what's he talking about? So Jason Laycock and I turn and look back, and sure enough, there's my body hanging from the noose. Needless to say, I was completely shocked. Um, I don't have that great of eyesight. I need glasses, and uh, at that time, it was no different. But I could still tell from the outline that it was me, you know? So I immediately just shocked. I just stood up. You know, and I turned and faced my body, which was hanging from that noose, roughly about 30 feet away. And uh, I walked out, and I walked over closer to I was about, you know, maybe 15 feet away, so I could get a better look. And sure enough, it was, it was definitely me. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking to myself, how can you know? I, uh, how can I be there and here at the same time? I look down, and I'm sure enough, I'm wearing the same green. Uh, T-shirt, the same brown well belt, uh, the same camouflage pants, the same black boots. I even pulled my dog tags out and I was still wearing them. Um, but it was when I pulled my dog tags out that I dropped them and I looked at my hand and I realized that if I stared at my hand, I could see through my hand and see the, the sand on the ground. And uh, that's when I realized I was dead. And uh, I had been dead and sitting next to my friends for five minutes. And then I realized they didn't even know I was there. They couldn't see me. I mean, um, and uh, that's when uh, Jason Laycock came up and he knelt down beside me and he took a photograph of my body hanging from that noose. And I was standing there right beside him. And of course, he had no clue that I was standing beside him. Um, but anyway, um, he goes, now that's a good picture, and snaps the last photo, the, the film began to rewind, and uh, he, uh, 
Corporal uh, Toby Page walked up and looked beside him and just gave him this stupid look like, uh, are you, and he actually said what, exactly what I was thinking, are you retarded? He goes, look at him. And of course he was said a few expletives, which I will not repeat, but uh, he goes, look at him. He goes, his, his nose is blue, his lips are blue, his, his eyelids are blue. There's drool hanging out of his mouth all the way down to the ground. And he goes, uh, are you a bleeping retard? You know? And uh, he stood up and he took a couple steps forward. I mean, because Jason Laycock has these really thick bottle lens glasses. And uh, his eyesight's no better than mine. And uh, I'm going to give you a basic description of Jason Laycock. Um, Jason Laycock was uh, an S2 intelligence, very intelligent guy. Um, despite all the funny things you can say about intelligence people, he really was intelligent. Um, uh, kind of nerdish, a um, little bit underweight, probably about 110 pounds, 5'10", um, maybe 5'9". And, uh, but uh, not a bad looking guy. I mean, if he had packed on a few, four, few more pounds, maybe 30, 40 pounds, he would, uh, I'd put him in the handsome category, but um, Corporal Page um, was probably about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, about the same height. Um, only he was a real buff guy because he worked out in the gym a lot. Most uh, and most uh, administration guys, S1 administration guys, don't go to the field all that often. Um, so uh, he probably spent three or four hours in the gym every day. He had a little bit of an acne problem, um, but it's probably from taking all those uh, supplements. Um, uh, but anyway. Um, after he took the picture and the uh, little guy berated him a little bit, he uh, Corporal Jason Lycock stood up, took a couple steps forward, and then realized that what he was saying was true. He saw that my extremities on my face were blue, so he tossed his camera off the over towards his rack, not really caring for its care at all where it landed. He just tossed it, and he ran for it. He grabbed my body around the waist and picked up. When he did this, um, he screamed for uh, Corporal Page to come over there and uh, get the uh, noose off my neck. Now, myself, I was thinking it was a little bit backwards. I mean, the tough guy should have been picking me up while the other guy was getting the rope off my neck. In my mind, that's the way that it should have worked. I'm glad that it didn't work that way, though, because otherwise I would still be in that noose. Um, because... Corporal Page, for all his strength, barely got the noose off my neck. And I mean, he had to really struggle with it. And it was something to watch him struggle with it. While he was struggling with it, I actually thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to try to step into my body and stand up. And uh, <laughs> bad idea when I tried that. When I stepped forward into my, trying to step forward into my body, it was just like somebody slugged me. I mean, just as hard as I could possibly be hit. And uh, the sense of vertigo came over, you know, it overtook me and just weakened me. So I actually stumbled backwards, like dizzy. And I said, okay, uh, bad idea. And that's actually when I became concerned. I wasn't too concerned before. Um, even though I realized I was dead, I was not concerned about it, which is an odd thing, I know. And uh, mostly unbelievable. I mean, I was just mostly in shock. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, um, they managed for all his strength. It took him two or three tries to get the uh, the rope off my neck, and he was just exhausted afterwards. I mean, he was his arms were completely burned out. And uh, like I said, this is a guy who lifts weight in the in the gym constantly, um, so he really exerted himself. If it had been the other way around, uh, Jason's small frame would have never been able to get that rope off my neck even though the other guy could probably help me up for hours. Um, but it never would have come off. Um, so uh, anyway, they drag my body over and they throw it on uh, my rack. And uh, immediately, um, Cole Page began to freak out. I mean, he's like, oh my God, we got to tell somebody. We got we to gotta do something. I mean, he was in the, the go-go-go-go mode while... Uh, 
couple Page was sitting over there like the thinker. You could tell his mind was just turning at a million miles an hour. And uh, he was looking over there at, uh, at Cole Page, and he was like, shut up, stop pacing. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking. You know, I mean, he was the thinker. I mean, if he could have come, uh, come with a way to, or a story to, to, to throw over this so that uh, they could have gotten out of it, he would have been the one to come up with it. Uh, while the other guy was just completely freaking out. Um, in the meantime, I thought, okay, well, this is my opportunity. My body's not moving around anymore. It's laying down. It's, you know, in a stable position. I'll just lay back down into my body. And so that's pretty much what I did. I placed my foot inside of my foot and my other foot inside my foot. And I sat down just like I'm sitting now. And I looked back and saw how my body was laying and how my head was positioned. So I just leaned back into my body. And as my head went inside my head, because um, you got to remember, my soul was laying down into my body. Um, I know it sounds weird when I say my foot inside my foot, my head inside my head, but you know, you'll get the picture now. Um, so anyway, I'm leaning back, and as soon as my head falls inside my head, I'm instantaneously standing up. And I'm in complete darkness. I mean, it's... Um, it's a darkness that you could almost feel. I know it sounds weird, it doesn't make any sense, but uh, that's the only way that I can put it. I mean, because uh, this darkness had like a texture to it. Um, and it was complete darkness. It was just solid black. And I know the first thing I thought to myself is, well, where am I, you know? And I had no clue where I was. I was still wearing everything that I had been wearing before, only I was just in this place that I didn't recognize at all. And uh, the first thing I notice is that there is nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean absolutely nothing. There's no light, no wind, no sound, nothing. And I thought to myself, there can't be nothing. I'm standing on something. So I look down, and I'm standing on nothing. I mean, the only way I can liken it to is is if you went inside of a giant warehouse and elevated yourself a good 30 feet off the ground until you and stood on a plate of glass so that when you dimmed the lights you couldn't see the ground beneath you but yet you could still see beneath you that's the only way I can explain it too. It was like standing on air that had that was hard as stone but um, had no reflection you know, it's like standing on hardened air or glass that had no reflection. That's the, that's the closest I can come to explaining it. But when you look down, you can literally see beneath your feet for a couple of feet down. But you were standing on nothing. And uh, um, I thought to myself, well, if I was in a completely dark room, I wouldn't be able to see my hand in front of my face. How is it that I'm able to see what there's light coming from somewhere? And so I look up, because that's where pretty much all sources of light are, whether you're inside or outside, they're above you. So I looked up, and I see nothing. And uh, that's when I realized that I was the one that was emanating the light that I was able to see with. Um, I was glowing like a, like a chem light. You know, those little, little shake lights that you use for walking around on Halloween or for the military. We used it for different things, but... Uh, the little chemical lights that had the little glass thing in it and you break them and you shake them up. I was glowing like that. I was glowing this very, very dim white light that I was able to see maybe 10 feet in, in a complete 360 all around me in all directions I could see away from me because I was emanating this light. But that's how dim it was. Um, I thought to myself, okay, well, I don't understand how I'm emanating this light. It doesn't make any sense to me, but what I do know is one thing. I'm standing on some kind of ground. And I thought to myself, if there's a ground, maybe there's a ceiling. So I went to reach my hand up, and as I reached my hand up, um, I touched the ceiling without touching it. And I know how ridiculous that sounds. Um, but if you can imagine your consciousness reaching up 
and touching something and knowing for a hundred percent sure that it's there without having to physically touch it. I mean, it's not such an alien concept in, in all actuality. I mean, because with light, we're able to see everything around us. I mean, I can see that mirror that's, you know, a good 15 feet behind me, maybe 20 feet behind me. I can see that mirror. I don't have to go over there and touch it to know it's real. Um, but I know for 100% sure that it's there. And the same way, and it kind of shocked me because I jerked my hand back down. I was like, whoa, there's a ceiling up there. And I know that it's there. I can't see it. But I know for 100% sure that it's there. And uh, I said, okay, I don't understand that either. There's a lot of things I didn't understand about this place but uh, or how I was able to feel things without touching them. I mean, some of these things just made no sense to me whatsoever. But I thought to myself, okay, there's a floor, there's a ceiling. Ceilings don't hold themselves up. There's got to be a wall somewhere. If there's a wall, there's a door, there's a window, there's a way out of here. So I went to take a step forward to go find myself a door to get out. And, you know, and as I took a step forward, the only way I can describe it is like a rubber band. If you take a rubber band, you can stretch it. And that's how my it's either my body did or my consciousness did. All I know is I found myself moving forward at a very rapid pace, but yet my back foot was still in place. As I stretched out and wanted to go that direction, I did at a very rapid pace. I stretched out maybe like one, two, three football fields while the back stays in place, the front stretching out, and that's the only way I can explain it. All I know is I knew for 100% sure that I was moving forward at a very rapid pace but I was getting nowhere. So with my back foot in place, I began to spin, and as I'm stretching out, um, I begin to realize that I'm standing in between two parallel planes that stretch on forever, and there's, um, there's no walls, there's no doors, there's no windows. I'm trapped in between these two parallel planes and there's no way out. And when I realized that, I pulled my foot back and put it down without even having left where I was standing. I, like I said, I stretched out at least three football fields worth of length, a good 300 yards. And uh, from that point, I became very scared. And, uh, But before I could even think another thought, I was snatched up off of my feet by a very, very large demon. Um, of course, for me, I didn't know what had happened. It was like getting hit by a truck uh, and having no clue that it was ever coming. Um, this thing had come up on, come up behind me so fast. Um, and it caught me by complete surprise, and it was so big. Um, I can't possibly begin to describe what it's like being, uh, what it feels like to be in the grips of something that big. But I'll, I'll do my best. Um, one minute I'm standing there, and the next minute I'm leaning backwards like this, my feet are out more or less in front of me and they're popping and I have this pain just shooting from my head to my feet like a bolt of electricity but it's not stopping it's like being constantly shot or electrocuted um, and I had this pounding sensation this hurt hurting pounding sensation coming from my left shoulder that hurts even worse than the, this electricity that's running to my body and I look to my left and I see these fingers which come down to roughly the bottom of my chest and it was even hard to look over to the side because the, the depth of its hand was like this the width of its hand was like this I mean it literally went from the side of my neck up to maybe past the end of my shoulder the width of its hand um, uh, the color of its skin was black and red. Now I don't know if it was 
red with black shadows moving across it or if it was red with a black oily substance like a cloud moving beneath the skin so that it makes it have an, uh, a perception of moving while it's standing still. You know, kind of like the sky stands still and the clouds move across it. Kind of like that. I, I, I'm watching these giant red fingers with blackness moving through it. Now, like I said, I don't know if it was shadows or if it was a substance beneath the skin. All I know is the fingers were very big. Each one was about this big around and roughly about this long. And this thing was crushing my left shoulder. Now, one thing I do understand in retrospect is that pain when you have no body. When you have a body, I can break a finger and it only hurts here where the break is. It doesn't hurt at my feet. But when you're in your soul's body, when your soul experiences pain, you experience it everywhere because there's no pain receptors to, st to, to, to stop your brain from saying, oh, it hurts here. No, it hurts everywhere. Anywhere you experience pain, it runs through your body like, uh, like electricity. You feel it from the top of your, from the very top of your hairs to the bottom of the soles of your feet. Um, if I hit you in the leg, you would feel it in your ear. <laughs> For as weird as that sounds, um, you would feel it everywhere. Because like I said, there's no specific pain receptors. You just feel pain as if it were a bolt of electricity through your entire body. The only thing that lets you know exactly where you receive that pain from would be that pounding sensation, kind of like a heartbeat. Um, that throbbing sensation when you got an infection. Um, that's the only thing that lets you know exactly where you've been hit. You feel it everywhere though. And uh, this thing had a hold of me and I'm looking down at these fingers and I'm just thinking to myself, what is this that has a hold of me? And as I'm thinking this, I understand now, also in retrospect, that anything that you think in this place can be heard as if you had spoken it out loud. And this thing had me like this and was just smiling at me. It had looked back and it was smiling at me, waiting for me to look at it. And uh, when I looked over my shoulder and up at it, it was already staring at me. And I understand now that it had heard what I was thinking and just wanted to give me a nice little shock, you know, on top of the pain that I was already experiencing. Um, just because of the grotesqueness uh, of its face. I mean, this thing was grotesque. Um, and it was... <laughs> huge. Um, overall, the thing, and I know this sounds already more crazy than everything that I've already said, but this thing is 13 feet tall. And it's not like I sat there and said, okay, uh, stand still. Let me grab a, a step ladder and measure you. Uh, where's my tape measure? You don't know. No. Anything that you want to know in this place, all you have to do is ask it. Ask it in your mind or ask it out loud and the answer will be given to you. It doesn't matter. Um, and I thought to myself, how big is this thing? And it, the answer immediately came to me, 13 feet. It was exactly, exactly 13 feet tall. Um, and I didn't ask myself how much it weighed, otherwise I would know that too. All I know is the thing was huge. It was built like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. I mean, just whipped full of muscles. Um, just big. It's, like I said, its skin was black and red. It had no hair whatsoever on its body, none. Um, like no hair up here, no mustache, no beard, no hair on the knuckles like I have. Um, just just um, completely hairless. Um, it's completely humanoid in shape though. I mean, it had two legs, two arms, one mouth, one nose, two ears. Other than that, it looked completely human. Um, the differences was this, where our eyes are white. Um, it was yellow. And um, where the iris of our eyes can be green or blue or brown, um, it was, um, gold and uh, diamond shaped like a snake's and uh, 
It had a really flat nose. I mean, just looked like somebody was literally pushing its nose against its face and its nose was easily as wide as its mouth. Um, so a really flat, really wide nose and um, gleaming white teeth. I mean, perfectly shaped, just like a human's, probably better than mine. <laughs> and uh, it had, the only thing that looked really strange about its teeth was it had, where we have our canines, it had two tusks coming up out of its mouth like a boar. Uh, like a wild pig. Um, it was a... Uh, like I said it was just very large, 13 feet tall, and uh, just extremely muscular. And uh, this thing, like I said, it just picked me up. Like uh, I weighed nothing to it. And uh, it was taking me along for a ride. And... Uh, but just the, I only looked at its face for, I would say a second, and that's all that it took. Yeah, I was just, as a man, I'm not afraid of any other man on the face of this earth. I will fight anybody, I don't care how much bigger they are than me, but this thing, there was, there was no fighting it. I mean, it was, it was far too big. I mean. 13 feet tall versus 6 feet tall, I could stack another one of me on top of my head and still not be as tall as it. You know, and if I had to guess, I would say roughly about in between 3,000 and 4,000 pounds. I, mean, I don't know for sure, I'm just guessing, but I would say that's a pretty fair estimate. Um, um, and the thing, like I said, it just picked me up and took off with me, and I'm not sure if my feet were popping out of just uh, sheer pain or if it was the speed at which we were moving but this thing was running it had me by one hand by the shoulder it had me by the shoulder with one hand and uh, it was moving at a very very fast velocity if I would guess I would say probably at over 80 to 100 miles an hour. Um, just rough guess. Um, it may have been faster than that, I don't know. But all I know is the thing was moving very, very fast. And uh, had complete control. I mean, just... Um, there was nothing, nothing at all I could do to get away or anything like that. And uh, I looked at its face for only a second, and it was enough to scare me. Um, and uh, it, it would be enough to scare anybody, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I looked away from it, and from that point forward, uh, the only way I can describe it is, is all hope uh, just poured out of me. I f literally felt hope and emotion as if it were a physical substance like water in a cup just being poured out of me. I literally felt hope pour out of me starting from the inside of my head it just drained out of my body all the way down and right out through my feet. And once hope left me it was like I became numb. My feet were still popping uh, but I couldn't feel any pain. It was just like I was just drained completely of all strength. Any energy that I had was just gone. It was uh, of all strength. Any energy that I had was just gone. It was uh, I don't know if this is in the Bible or not, but I think that uh, the strength of hope is in God. You know, and without God, without any hope, you don't really have a reason to live. You don't have a reason to fight. You don't have any strength whatsoever. So without hope, you don't have strength. And I know that's kind of grasping at straws in a way, but for me, it makes sense. And uh, after hope left me, and I was just kind of like going along for the ride, just numb realizing that this thing was taking me wherever it wanted to take me that's the next thought that came to me is where is it taking me and then the the thought instantly 
came to my mind, the answer did. Um, and the answer was, it's taking you to hell. Now, when I grew up in a Baptist church, I, taught, I was taught hell was fire and brimstone. That's an empty void of an area. But that's also in the Bible, too. We just don't pay much attention. And they shall be cast out into outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The outer darkness that they're speaking of is where I landed. Um, for those who are evangelical and believe that um, hell was literally split in half at one time before Jesus died on the cross into one part that was called Abraham's bosom and to another part that was um, the portion of fire where people were still tortured uh, as Jesus uh, talked about it in uh, one of his parables. Uh, I think this was one of those things that was not really a parable. I think it was a true story uh, of Lazarus and the, the rich man um, where the one was being consoled in Abraham's bosom and the other and only separated by a short distance by a, an impassable chasm. Or, uh, you know, but I think that they were both both portions of those things were in hell, um, but the demons couldn't cross over into the nice part. And I believe, and I, this is just my own personal assumption, that when Jesus descended down into hell, he descended not down into the fire and brimstone portion of it, but down into the, um, down into the Abraham's bosom portion of it, and he took those people back with him, and more or less took the lamb with him and all the people and connected it to the city of God which is where he came from um, it connected that outer portion of green land where there was water remember because uh, Lazarus said if you can just well, the rich man said if Lazarus could just dip his finger in water and bring it over here because I'm burning up in these flames there was water there so the, there was land there there was grass there there was trees there I mean it was a viable land as much as this earth is a viable land, um, just in a heavenly realm sort of way. Um, but anyway, um, this I understood that it was taking me to the portion that I did not, certainly anyone would not want to go to, which was the fire and brimstone portion. It was going to take me to that fiery lake and cast me in, and I understood that. And when I understood that, it it was mortally appalling, is the only way I can put it. I mean, I just, it played over and over in my head again. It's taking me to hell, it's taking me to hell, it's taking me to hell. And uh, there was just nothing I could do. Nothing I could do to stop it, nothing I could do to prevent it. And uh, I just kind of dropped my head. And uh, while this is playing over and over and over in my head that it's taking me to hell. And uh, I saw this um, pinpoint of light, you know, uh, well, before I saw the pinpoint of light, I started thinking to myself, you know, this is wrong. I'm not a bad guy. I've never murdered anyone. I've never molested any children. I've never uh, raped any women or done anything just drastic that you know would, would cause you to be placed in hell for sure. Um, for me, I was just an average person. I drank a few beers, smoked a few cigarettes. I didn't even wasn't like like into drugs or you know anything like that. I mean, I was just an average guy. Um, I go to church every once in a while, you know. So I didn't really pitch myself as bad, you know, not bad enough to end up in hell. But uh, one thing that I understand now is there's a lot of plenty of good people in hell. A lot of people that used to call themselves Christians are there, and uh, and it's because they didn't really devote their life to God. They lived one foot in and one foot out, like I did, you know. And uh, you don't have to be a bad person to go to hell. All you have to do is just be average. And God doesn't call us to be average. He calls us to be holy, like He is, you know. And what that really means is, is you gotta. Uh, for lack of better words, you don't have to become a Bible-thumping Christian, but you should devote your life to God for as much as you possibly can. And if that puts me in the 
category of Bible thumping Christian, then so be it. I'm a Bible thumping Christian. I would rather be that than in the middle. Because um, I know where the, in the middle gets you. It gets you in the same place that being fully against him gets you. It's kind of like he said in Revelations 3.20. I wish that you were all the way for me or all the way against me. But because you were in the middle, because you were lukewarm, I spit you out. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be that again. I don't want to go back to hell. I know it's there. and I know it, the, the place is not made for us. It was made for them. And we just unfortunately do not realize the, the, the reality of the place. The reality of the place is far worse than, than you can imagine. And I only experienced a taste of it. I landed on the doorstep of hell. That's the way I like to look at it. Or you can even say I landed in the middle of the hell, but it wasn't fire and brimstone, although I know for certain that it does exist because that's where it was taking me. And although I never laid eyes on the flames, I know that they really do exist. Um, but as I was thinking this to myself, that I'm not such a bad guy while I'm ending up here, that's when that light appeared. And uh, I looked up at it, it looked like a star off far off in the night sky something so tiny and insignificant and far away that it could not possibly help me and then I saw it it moved off to the left a little bit and I picked my eyes up you know and my head up and I looked at it and I thought to myself did we just change direction or did it move you know and it went back to the right and uh, I thought for myself no for certain we didn't change direction it moved and I thought to myself well, what is that and as I thought that and began to focus in on it, it just came rushing at me like a... The only way I can describe it is the speed of this thing was like a bolt of lightning. It came at me so fast that one moment it was just like a tiny little star in the night sky and the next minute, white, bright, blinding white light. And his hand was reaching down to me and it was an angel. myself I'm going to reach up there and grab his hand and this hand is going to save me because that's all that I saw was just a hand but uh my hand just my hand knew what to do it was like having a baseball throw at your head somebody says heads up and you just reach up and grab it it's a reflex my hand just reflects and a reflex just jumped up and grabbed this angel's head and as soon as I touched its head, we were all three, we were all motionless and all standing back up on this ground that you can't see. And uh, this, this, uh, this beast, this demon, is still had me by the shoulder. It was kind of almost even leaned over a little bit to grab me by the shoulder. And uh, I could... Uh, Instinctively, I knew to stand still because if I had moved, I know that would have ripped my shoulder and my arm off at the same time and just beat me with it. I mean, the thing was just that massively strong. I know, I knew, and I knew within me there was something telling me, "Don't, don't move, don't move." And uh, and I'm just standing there, staring up, looking at this angel, and the angel itself to describe it for you was nine feet six inches tall it had brown wavy hair pushed to the back it had an olive color skin um, it wasn't really white it wasn't really black it was somewhere in between but the light that was emanating from within it was so bright white that it almost practically overshadowed the color of its skin you couldn't even really you had to stare to see the color of its of, of its skin and I keep saying it because it's an it it's not really a he or a she. Um, although the body is shaped like a he. Okay, it's shaped like a male. When you look at its face, the face is like the most handsome man that you've ever seen, blended in perfectly with the most beautiful woman that you've ever seen. I mean, when you look at this angel, you think to yourself, wow, he is beautiful. And I know that's some odd words to say. In the English... Uh, 
the the male is known as handsome and the female is known as beautiful but uh, this angel was absolutely beautiful there's no other words for it and uh, its eyes were uh, blue and I mean when I mean blue I mean perfect blue like, like someone took a portion of the sky and put it in its eyes or dipped a cup out of the ocean and poured it into its eye there was no flaw in it no flaw um, perfectly beautiful in all ways um, other than its face looking like uh, the cross between a man and a woman and I don't mean like oh is it pet you know no I mean just beautiful um, it was completely shaped like a man uh, you can see it's underneath its white robe it had chest and it had strong arms um, it had an Adam's apple I mean it was every bit shaped like a man and a strong one. I mean, just strong, but not like overly ridiculous like this. It wasn't bodybuilder. It was more like fitness trainer strong. Um, it wasn't like bodybuilder strong where it just had muscles popping out of everywhere it shouldn't have been uh, like this demon. Um, but you could tell it was this angel was there to fight. And... Uh, he had on a white robe. It was cut down in a V in the front uh, with gold lace. I guess, I don't even know what to call it. Like embroidered gold around the edges of its collar. And uh, not lace, but embroidered gold. And uh, the sleeves came just below the elbows. And the, it, this robe was kind of like a white uh, Roman tunic robe. I guess that would be the way, uh, best way of putting it. And it came just below its knees. So its knees and its elbows were covered. Um, and I was just so blown away by the beauty of, uh, of it that I didn't even really check to see if it had any shoes on or not. I don't really remember. All I know is uh, it was big. Uh, not as quite as base the demon, but big enough. And uh, I'm looking up at it, and I'm just blown away by its brightness and its beauty. And uh, at the same time, I'm just frozen in place because I know that, th that if I move this thing, it's going to rip my shoulder off and just beat me with my arm. And uh, this thing, I can feel its anger, um, this demon's anger, like like heat from a fire. And uh, it turns around like this to see what had stopped it and why. It wanted to know what had stopped it and why. Uh, because technically, I was right where I belonged. And... Uh, once you're there in hell, you you don't normally get a chance to leave. Um, so it owned me like a piece of furniture, like like uh, your car. Uh, it owned me, and it wanted to know why it was being stopped. So it turned around and was ready to fight. Make no mistake, uh, this demon was ready to get down in the worst way. Uh, but it, as it whipped around, this angel just, its speed was incredible. And it just rushed forward and with an open palm hit this demon. And it had to angle its arm upwards uh, at about the height of its head to hit this demon in the chest. And it hit this demon with such power. I mean, I, I can't describe the fierceness of, of the power of this thing. But it hit this demon with such force that its hand was literally ripped from my shoulder. It, it had no clue what had hit it by the time it had even turned its head. It was already hit. And this demon uh, was hit with such force that it literally folded up and started flying backwards. Folded in half like this, flying backwards. And uh, I'm just watching it fly backwards and skip off this ground that you can't see like a, like a stone over water. And um, this angel looked at me and he called me by a long name. And I un immediately understood it to be mine. It was a heavenly name. But as soon as it called me this name, it took it from my mind. It called me this name to let me know that, um, more or less, that I still have a chance to make it into heaven. You know, like, I have a heavenly name. I squandered it. I wasted it. And if this had been my f 
ultimate time, my last breath, for real, uh, that's where I would have stayed. But when he called me this long name, it was a feeling of home. You know, like when your mom calls you uh, for dinner or supper, however you want to say it, and uh, you know that it's time to go in and eat and you're all happy, you know, because you just stayed outside playing forever. You know, and you're about to go in and sit with your family. It was like that. You know, it was a feeling of home. And uh, it, uh, it looked at me and it began to speak to me and its voice was like, uh, like a waterfall. If a waterfall could speak, it was like a rushing sound in your ears, like shh, Sean. And uh, I understood later on that it was converting my understanding to understand its language. It didn't descend down to my broken language of English. It elevated me up to understand its language. It messed with my mind, for lack of better words but it elevated my understanding and uh, he looks at me and he says hello my name is Michael <laughs> and I, I immediately knew that this was the archangel of the Bible that that um, it spoke of the, arch, the archangel Michael and uh, I can tell you for certain I've seen them both. I've seen the archangel and I've seen Jesus and they look nothing alike. And they are not the same being. Um, but anyway, he said, uh, he began to speak to me but I got distracted by this demon that had gotten back up and was coming back after me. It was coming back to get me. And I was coming back to fight this angel for my soul. And uh, so I turned back because I knew that it was coming. I'm sorry. Uh, so it was, this angel was still talking to me, so I wasn't really listening to it. I was too focused in on this thing. And it was getting bigger. It was running back after me. And it was getting faster. And it was getting bigger. So it was coming back after me. You know, from this great distance that this angel hit it and uh, he so I look back at him like whatever you got to say please just hurry up and say it and if you're gonna get me out of here please get me out of here you know and this is what I was literally thinking you know and he just looked at me and he gave me a uh, a saddened look and he looked at me and he just goes your time has not yet come it's time for you to go and he points his finger and when I step in that direction my soul immediately went back to my body. Just as fast as I had l appeared in this place, I left this place and I was back in my body, laying on that cot where I knew I should have my eyes opened. And it took me a good 20 minutes to uh, get to walking again simply because my entire body had fallen asleep. And uh, I'm almost certain that after having been dead for eight minutes that there there must have been angels there jump starting everything in my body again because there would have been no blood flowing anywhere